You've probably seen these videos of the New York crane collapse on the news from last week. Video here shows the dramatic moments the crane's boom came down, slamming into a building across the street. Twelve people were hurt, including three firefighters. And then lastly, here is a third angle shot from another street. And then here's a zoomed in shot of it so you can see how the crane boom just fell apart. Think I'll give this little tug a lucky low check for safety violation. So today we're going to analyze this crane collapse and we're going to find out what was the root cause of this. We're going to look into the past of the company that owns this crane and I'm going to show you what caused its previous two fatal crane collapse accidents. And I'll even throw in a couple of free bonus crane collapse accidents for you that we can take a look at to see what the cause was. So why do so many cranes collapse? That's what makes it scary, I think. And I've been following this for about 20 years, all these different crane collapses, and I always steer clear of cranes when I see them. The one thing about the crane collapses is they often happen with very little notice at all, usually within a second or two. There's that fine line between being fully balanced and collapsing. But why does this line keep getting pushed? We've also had crane collapses near me, too. Here's one that happened in Tamarack, Florida, near me a few years back. This was a crane truck that tipped over while trying to lift up a Florida power and light uh, power pole. And then we had another crane that one time collapsed on a hospital in Margate, Florida, not far from us as well. So what is it about these crane collapses? The New York Fire Department produced this video using their drone that they flew up there in front of the crane uh, to get a better idea of how to put out the fire. And you can see they've got two streams coming from across the street. And I believe only one of them is making any type of contact, but not directly on the fire, apparently. It's coming close. So they're having a hard time really getting to it and putting this thing out. It's burning out of control. And then here's the drone coming back in for a landing. So you're looking at an isolated structure and an elevation as well. So you're trying to get the water stream over maybe 250 feet to put out that fire. So we operate that drone at a constant basis, you know, providing that uh, constant visual to that incident commander, providing that, uh, that firefighter or that the one is in charge of the commander of the stream, let him know, hey, this is the conditions that we're seeing and where to direct the stream. I have a, a, a constant view of what's going on and a, a constant idea of, uh, of the conditions. Now, check out this photo of the rooftop from across the street where the firemen were set up and trying to spray the water. See how that water stream is horizontal? It shouldn't be that way. I don't know why they didn't set it up at a 45 degree angle because that is what gives you the maximum distance. So if you look at this chart here, hey, this is one of the first things we learned in engineering school back in college was that 45 degree angle gives you the longest trajectory. And I love this shot they gave us here of the nozzles. It shows a good clear shot of both the streams. You can see the lower stream on the right is just completely horizontal. That's useless. That's why you'll see in the other videos, this is the stream that couldn't even reach anywhere near the crane. Whereas the second one had a better chance because it was up, as you can see at an angle, but not quite at 45 degrees. If they had just tilted that hose up a little more, I bet they would have gotten it right on top of that crane, right by the engine compartment where it was needed. So now when we pull up the New York City Department of Buildings, we want to look at what the crane is, what they're saying about it. All they are saying for now is that there's a partial stop work order that exists on this property. And anyway, when you come down and look at the crane information, let's see, it's very strange that it says there's no records found for a crane. So that's kind of odd because they said that all the permits and everything were up to date. So I don't know. So your guess is as good as mine as to why there's no record on here of the crane or anything. And there's no open violations at the site. So the crane is owned by the New York Crane Company. And this company has somewhat of a sordid past in terms of previous fatalities in crane accidents. Yeah, so based on uh, the different crane models that they have here, um, I suspect it's this one here, the 760. And so when you pull up the spec for it, we want to take a look at what's going on by the engine compartment there. 
Uh, let's see, so here they're showing the typical crane assembly, and this is what we're looking at. Here's the cab where the, the crane operator was sitting, and the fire broke out here in the power pack. So usually inside this power pack here is the diesel engine. This may be the fuel tank. And so if you're wondering why the fire was burning out of control, well, here's your answer right here. The power pack includes 850 liters of oil. Now that's going to burn. Now here's the crane in better days when it was still intact. So here's what it looks like inside that crane's engine compartment. Now the fire department seems to think that the root cause of this fire would be maybe a hydraulic oil leak or maybe, you know, fuel, some, some type of fuel maybe dripped down onto the engine or some other hot component inside there. Whose fault is this? Is this the fault of the crane operator or is it the fault of the crane company? the company that actually owns the crane sometimes the crane operators are not employees of the crane company they're just freelancers whose responsibility is it then to open up those engine compartments and inspect those hoses on a regular basis because if that's the case it looks like somebody was lacking because how do you miss a worn down hose or a connection okay so we have a probable cause for the fire but the question remains is what caused the boom of this crane to come collapsing down and dropping many hundreds of feet down to the ground below, injuring 12 people? Well, the answer to this one is a lot more simple. If you look at this drawing here from the manufacturer on their spec sheet, here is the boom of the crane. This is the part that fell. And what happens is it's held in place here by these tension lines. See all of these cables here? And then you got these cables up here as well. And I would venture to say that it was probably this one that broke right here because remember the fire was back in here and it was pretty much contained into this little area. I doubt that the heat went through these two cables. I think it went through these two right here. I think the heat went through this cable right here. And so if you do that and this thing snaps, there's nothing really now to hold the boom up. So when that happens, now the boom starts to swing downward. And just like we saw in the videos, that were all over the news, it swings downward and now it's just dangling off of that point with nothing else to help support it and it just falls straight to the ground. All right, so here's our favorite crane in better times. This is the view from Google Street Maps. This was shot in March of 2023, four months before the collapse. And so this is the line that I believe got affected by the heat. I think this is that line right there, see, as it comes down because the fire was all back in here. So it could have been these other lines, but they come way over forward here and on this side. So I don't think they got affected too much by it. But wait, there's more folks, because the New York Crane Company is no stranger to disasters. They were involved in two previous fatal crane accidents in 2008, both within two months of each other. And there's a plot twist for us too because I'm going to show you some corruption that was uncovered and documented in the New York Department of Buildings that materialized itself as fake crane inspections. So the first of the two deadly collapses happened on March 15th, 2008 at 303 East 51st Street in New York. Getting ready to jump the crane, which means they're adding more sections onto it to increase its height so that they can add more floors to the building that they're working on. So New York 311 system gets a complaint from somebody saying, you know, by the way, over this job site here, which they had already had numerous complaints, somebody complained that there wasn't enough uh, safety straps on the crane tower, and that should have been the first sign of trouble. Um, as they were jumping the crane, one or more of the straps gave way. So now there's nothing holding the crane against the building. And then the crane ended up toppling over, leaning up against the building across the street. And I guess the rest of it came crashing down and it killed six people. See, it happened when they were installing this third collar. And the, the collars are supposed to be several floors apart. This one here should be maybe on the second or third floor. And this one, maybe a few more floors above it. And then this one, I think, was going to be placed at the ninth floor of the building. So what happened was when the straps broke, the third one comes down, crashes onto the second one, breaks all of its connections, and they both come crashing down onto the first one. So now all of your collars are almost at ground level, and then there's nothing now to hold the crane up against the building. It's, it's a worst-case scenario. If you look at the bottom left of the frame here, you can see all three collars that are stacked up on each other as they slid all the way down to the bottom. 
This right here is a picture of this crane that somebody actually took 55 minutes before the accident. And here you can see the crane's actually loading up its collar, which I imagine they were going to put right here onto the building and tie it into place. And you can see right here automatically what's wrong. There's two things wrong here. The straps should not be put around the vertical legs and, and they should not be against these sharp edges. You see how you got these sharp edges here of these metal legs? And so what happens is they dig into it and they start cutting these things. And they're also lacking the protection gear that's supposed to be over these straps to keep them from getting cut and sliced. So there's like four different errors going on here at once. You wouldn't even know it by looking at this picture if I didn't tell you about it. And then here's another one right here. You see this strap is down in what they call the V. So you see this V that's formed by this diagonal brace here with the vertical leg. And when you put a strap in that little cramped area like that, that creased area, it gets bunched. And when it gets bunched, and there's no bunch protection there for it, that lends it to getting sheared. And this is what happened. Also, you can see it looks like they've only got two straps there when there should have been four. And so that was another problem too. They used only half the amount of straps that the manufacturer calls to use. So there's another view of it down at the bottom, almost at ground level with, with all the collars slammed into each other. This gives you more of a perspective of, of what was going on here, see. So the, the tower is supposed to be going straight up and it attaches to the building through these collars. And then of course the engineers did all sorts of studying on the straps and they found out that one of the straps was worn beyond use and it should never have been used. And so the, the people doing the rigging should have known all of that. So there was just one error after another that led to the demise of these poor folks here. Yeah, see, and during their testing, you could see the strap was still attached to one of the collars here, and it just, boom, teared right in half. It sheared right off. And here's where there's a massive plot twist here, folks. You're going to love this one. So a New York City Department of Building inspector that was supposed to go and inspect this crane and five others, he claimed in the paperwork that he had gone and done these inspections and everything, when in fact he had not. So he was arrested for falsifying public records like that. And he was subsequently tried and found guilty. So what happens when the people who are supposed to protect you and me, when they're not out there doing their job, what crutch do we have to fall on? That's what made this, I think, such a, a big problem. Now, I don't know if the fact that he didn't inspect the crane, whether that manifested itself into, you know, would he have caught anything? We don't know. The building department is kind of trying to flush it under the carpet. The New York Crane Company's second collapse occurred two months later on May 30th, 2008. And here you can see a diagram from the newspaper. And what happened was they were building that tower crane there. And while it was operating, all of a sudden they heard a loud crack and the entire top part of the crane with the jib came falling down, tumbling down, and it hit the building across the street, severely damaging it. And it just left a big mess. And the crane operator in the crane operator's cab, he was killed as was somebody on the road down below. Now the root cause of this one is shocking. I mean, this one you would never have thought of in a million years. So what happened was a year before this crane collapse in the year 2007, lightning had struck this crane and it caused some damage to the turntable part, the bearing at the bottom of the, where the crane sits on top of the tower. So the owner of the company, James Lama, had decided to follow the really cheap, cheap, cheap route by having some cheap Chinese company do something with the bearing and welding it. And even the company that did that work wasn't confident in their own work. So this right here, as you can see on the screen, is sort of what the bearing looks like. This is one from, this one here is likely from another crane and you can see it is being fitted with new bearings. So what happened that caused this particular accident was that bearing part there that was all welded together, it broke at the weld, and that's what just caused the whole thing to fall apart. And then it just breaks off of the tower and drops right to the ground because there's nothing to hold it in place. Now, the owner of the New York crane company, James Loma, he is the self-proclaimed king of cranes. He was actually charged with manslaughter, but he was found not guilty. But he did lose in civil suits against the families and was supposedly ordered to pay. And he had a plane and he refused to sell the plane to help pay for it. And to my knowledge, I don't even know if he's paid anything at all, but he passed away in 2019. So let me ask you something. 
who does this remind you of? I can think of two people right now that this reminds me of. It reminds me of Stockton Rush, the CEO of OceanGate from the Titan sub implosion. And if you haven't seen our videos on those, make sure you go and check those out. I've got about seven or eight videos up for you that cover different parts of the analysis here of the implosion. The other person this reminds us of is Andrew Wold, the alleged slumlord from that Davenport, Iowa apartment complex that we also covered for you a few months ago, too. You m might want to check out that video as well. Now I have a bonus crane collapse for you. Now, this one was not from the New York Crane Company like the other ones were before. This is a different company, but it did happen in New York City on February 5th, 2016, and it killed one person on the street. Now, some of the reports say that the contractors all involved knew the day before on February 4th that it was going to be windy and stormy, and they should have lowered that crane down the night before and had it set with the boom all the way parallel to the ground. Why they did not do this, nobody knows. All right, so here's some pictures of what it looked like. What really surprised me is when this thing toppled over, it completely flipped over and went belly up the bottom of the crane on the ground, and you can see right here, it's amazing that the crane operator was able to escape out of here without getting killed. And here's some pictures of what it looked like all sprawled up down the road. Look at this. It's amazing that only one person was killed. Here's a couple of more photographs of it. And from the street view, you can see how it just like came right down at these cars here. So this is going to be a classic case of operator error. So what we look at here is we're looking at the data taken from the CPU, which is sort of like the black box for the cranes. And if you look at the bottom, see the accident happened at 9.29. That, that's where you see this bold red. But at 7.49 a.m., it was sitting at 80 degrees. We're talking the boom angle. And you can see that right around the time that, of the accident, it went down to 69.4. And then all of a sudden, very abruptly, down to 34.5. And just boom, you can see it went right to zero. All within a very short period of time here. So what caused that? Well, it turns out, here's your crane, right? Here's the main boom, and then here's their big old jib. And according to the instructions from the manufacturer, the jib angle is supposed to be at a certain angle, and the main boom angle is supposed to be also at this angle, and, and it's usually, they don't want it less than 80 degrees. If you have it less than 80 degrees vertical here, then it's not going to be stable, and it could collapse. And by the way, all of these numbers get worse when you have higher winds. They tell you to set the thing down. What the investigators did was they looked at several different possible angles here to see what would cause a problem and what's our safety factor. Here is the angle that the operator was at when the failure occurred, 69.4 degrees. So they have this chart here that shows right here, see this safety factor? That you're looking for a safety factor of greater than one for I think it was about 20 mile an hour winds at the time. So any of these that are above one, you're probably okay. But the further above one you are, the better you are. You, are. You, you don't want it to be at one or below, like see the ones in yellow? So that's what they found here. They, did, they ran these eight different cases here. And they found that one, two, three, four, five of these cases in yellow were below the safety margin. And so that's why the crane would have failed under those simulations. So that happened at that C, 69.4, 69.4. 65 anything below 80 it's showing it's going to fail so that was a problem that the crane operator had then see here in the in the instruction manual for the crane they had very specific instructions on what to do um, how to lay your crane down in the wind the contractors didn't even call the company to ask them can we do a jackknife configuration see so this would be a jackknife configuration right here so you have the boom here pres presumably at 80 degrees and then the jib comes down and it stays like this and then if you want to set the whole thing down like they suggest you just wheel this thing down till it flattens out so your two main reasons for the collapse of this crane was, of course, the operator error was the main contributing factor here because he took that crane boom below 80 degrees down to 69.4. And once he did that, it was compromised. There goes your balance. Uh, and then, of course, the construction crew should have parked it the night before before you got any dangerous winds. So it's because of accidents like this that I'm always nervous walking around cranes. I always tell people, avoid them whenever possible, especially if it's a windy day. Don't walk under them. If you see them working, I wouldn't walk anywhere near them. I would try to go, you know, mark it with your finger and go like this, and that's how far away you need to be from it. By the way, don't forget to binge watch some of our videos we've done on these other engineering collapses. 
So anyway, thank you so much for joining us tonight, folks, and we'll see you on the next one.